Once upon a time, two friends joined forces to bring you the best in horror entertainment. Brian from the north, Tim from the south, each bringing their own unique perspective to the horror community. Movie reviews, Blu-ray releases, beer pairings, games, and more. Welcome to your new home for horror. This is Civil Gore. Recently, Artsploitation Films was gracious enough to send us a few screeners to review. One of these was a gripping supernatural tale entitled The Dead Ones. We both really enjoyed the film and were lucky enough to also be able to set up an interview and discuss it with the director, Jeremy Kasten. Welcome to the show, Jeremy. Thank you. It's great to be here. Yes, thanks right. for coming along because uh, this, this, we both really like this film, so we're kind of really anxious to ask you a couple of questions about it here. I am uh, more than anxious to talk about it. I've been <laughs> trying to talk about this movie for 11 years, so I'm, <laughs> I'm excited to be at the point where I finally get to have these conversations. Awesome. Nice, nice. Yeah, so Jeremy, before we get into the film, uh, tell our listeners a little bit about yourself, how you got started in film, and kind of what some of your influences are. Ever since I was a kid, all I wanted to do, if you had asked six-year-old me, I wanted to make horror movies. I saw... Uh, uh, silent horror movies when I was really little at a camp where they showed the kids, you know, old Lon Chaney movies. And it, can you curse on the show? Do you oh know? yeah. Yeah, yeah sure. Okay. It fucked me up, but good. <laughs> and, and shortly thereafter, a friend of my parents took me to see alien in the theater when I was way too young. And that certainly, you know, whatever damage wasn't already done, that completed the job and I grew up loving the genre and always wanted to do this and went to film school and pretty much the day that I was done was in Los Angeles hustling and trying to figure out how to how to make my mark and um, I've made a bunch of movies all of which are horror movies and uh, and have had amazing experiences and now I have left Los Angeles and am uh raising a family and farming in maine uh oh, which is wow. a totally different chapter in my life <laughs> and in the background of making that life change for the last 11 years i've been i've been finishing the dead ones so it's been a very my first movie took four years and i thought i will never have as unpleasant an experience hmm. finishing a movie as that and here i am with 11 under my belt on this one <laughs> oh that's nice. great i love maine by the way I'm, I'm, i I love the we my wife and i go up there uh when we can because we like the breweries around there <laughs> there's quite a few it's pretty pretty it's an extraordinary place i hope it stays that way I yeah think with, uh, with covid there's a lot of the um you know rural places are going to change very fast and we're not that far from boston where i am in southern maine so you know that may change but but it is it's creepy and magical and and uh full of mystery and and weirdness yeah yeah i, I love it there <laughs> so uh, one more thing before we get into uh the the dead ones um Absolutely. this is more of a general question i have so you have an extensive list of editing credits so based on after you edit and then now when then you go to direct something what does that massive experience of editing have on an influence on your directing style and processes Everything I am proud <laughs> to say because one of the things that I fought to do very young in the industry was edit because I knew that um, I was not afraid to mess up. I'm not a computer guy, but it was at a time where things were no longer being cut on film and starting to be cut on computers. And I was cheaper <laughs> than all the people who'd been doing it forever. And there was a sort of a mystical quality to editors that you know what happens in that room and you know it's laborious and unpleasant in some ways which i love about it but it's intense and so it takes a certain kind of person and it gave me the opportunity especially from a young age to watch other people's mistakes um as you know first-time filmmakers or independent filmmakers and and think I am never going to do that. And sometimes I did, but mostly I tried to, to, in my career, stick to those lessons. They're really, it's about not shooting the same thing twice. If it's good, if you got a good take, you don't need a second good take. <laughs> that's a one good take and you should do a different version. And, um, and that's maybe in some ways the biggest thing, you know, not covering a whole scene from a wide shot. I always, I'm the, I'm, I'm even on my first movie, I'd shoot the first, you know, 
two lines of dialogue and the last two lines of dialogue from the wide shot and be like, okay, we're done. Let's cause you never <laughs> use it. You're never going to cut back out to the wide shot. So there's a lot of stuff like that, but I would attribute my ability. If you can call it that to, <laughs> to make a movie on the cheap that feels um, maybe bigger than it is, than, than the budgets would allow to working, to having an understanding of working with actors, because really that's the thing that directors lose so much time to on the set is, is you can't really make the crew light a scene faster and horror movies need weird light. <laughs> but you can show up with your actors prepared so that you're not, you know, doing 50 takes. Yeah. So you must, I, so you, do you go, cause I know when I'm, actually went to <laughs> to film school i didn't actually go that route in the end but i did do a lot of um fun projects back when i was doing that and i was thought i was going to be an editor one day and it was fun and because and by doing like small projects where you you know you film direct edit all as one person it really is kind of a different thing because you're kind of editing in your head as you you're recording Absolutely. and filming so you probably had kind of the same type of thing right when you for sure, for sure. You definitely know what you want and need. And um, you, especially when you're young, there's pushback from the script supervisor or other people sometimes on the set who say, but you, don't you need the whole scene covered in the wide shot? And you're like, I really don't. I really would rather shoot something else and not waste everybody's time. Um, and yeah, yeah. There's nothing like doing everything yourself but one of the things that I learned early on is that it, it is really a collaborative art and there's a reason to have, you know, not in every case, but there's a reason to have a bunch of people there. A lot of times they are seemingly standing around, but if you have <laughs> those people that are really capable who are also working with you to achieve your, your, make your story, there's nothing like it. I'll never do the blood effects on my own movie again <laughs> after the first time that I was like, oh, wait, somebody else pours the blood on the actor and they don't have to be pissed at me for being sticky? That's so great. <laughs> That's so, awesome. uh, so, Jeremy, I watched the movie today. Really, like, like we said, we really enjoyed it and, it. and it explores some themes that I haven't seen a lot of horror movies explore, which I thought was really, really cool about it. Um, so let's get into the dead ones. We know it was written by Zach Chastler. Hopefully I got that name right. Um, uh, someone you coll you collaborated with previously. So what in particular drew you to this project and the script? Well, we developed it with Zach from the get go. I knew that I wanted to make a movie that was more agile than my last movie. The movie I made before this I came out in 2007, believe it or not, and is The Wizard of Gore. And because of my experience oh, making right. The Wizard of Gore, I uh, wanted to make a movie where nobody was going to tell me how it, how I didn't have to fight. I knew that I could just make the movie. And so I was lucky enough to find someone who wanted to finance a horror movie that was about something. And we, we chose the subject matter very carefully and Zach was instrumental in that. But we also wanted to make a really fun horror movie. And so, you know, splitting that difference has always been the balance for the film. I love genre, but I really feel like when it is elevated and it's about something, David Cronenberg is great at this, making a great movie that's also full of depth and, and meaning and isn't, you know, look, I've watched my share of Jess Franco movies and, and, and Jean Roland and like, those movies are amazing. Obviously, the Giallo movement is based on not really having a lot to say, but those movies being incredible. So I'm not in any way disparaging movies that are just popcorn movies, but I do, for me, maybe because uh, I have a psychedelic bent to my filmmaking, <laughs> I like to try to have something else going on too. And the Dead Ones... Um, in 2009 when we shot it, which means we started conceiving of it in 07, there really was mostly Columbine. I mean, there had been other school shootings and some horrible tragedies, but it was almost like a groundswell. You could feel it coming. And it made it a lot harder to get the film finished because nobody, as, as you would start to talk to an investor about finishing the film, uh, you know, uh, a tragedy would happen and they would be more reticent, which I understand completely. I would probably feel the same way. But the controversial nature of it 
and still not exploiting it was that's a funny balance and i was really excited about walking that line because it's risky and that makes it cooler mm-hmm. yeah no and it and uh, this le- kind of leads into my next question a little bit with in terms of the the process and it kind of makes sense because when i was looking up some of this cast all their pictures looked a lot older i didn't realize it was that far when you <laughs> <laughs> filmed it but um so that's what I was going to say. So the cast in this was, I thought, was really good. I thought it was really, really well done. I think specifically um, the one that played uh, Alice uh, Mouse Morley, uh, Sarah Rose Harper, I thought she was good. Now, were you involved at all with the casting process? Every day for several weeks. Oh, okay. Because, yeah, like, how do you feel that came? Because I thought it was the casting. I thought everyone, like, played their roles perfectly. They were perfect. They, they had the right look, I think, for each of their characters. I do too. And I think that, that it's, it's the really uh, every film I'd made up to that point I made in Los Angeles and I was lucky enough on all of them to have stellar casts for, for genre films of people I'd always dreamed of working with. And that's an incredible thing, but it does change the tone of making a movie when you have an Udo Kier or a Crispin Glover, or a Seth Green yeah. or Jeffrey <laughs> Holmes, these guys, Danny Trejo is amazing, but he's not going to come to the, rehearsal for three weeks leading up to shooting for free and <laughs> and work on his character he's going to show up and be danny trail and that's an amazing look you know that's incredible when he what he what he does and when he does it it's always fun i really wanted to make a movie with teenagers about teenagers where they were played by people who weren't as polished weren't any less of actors, but weren't like on the Disney Channel next week and doing a, yeah. a yogurt ad the next week. And 17 year olds in LA, man, they've got like, they're a business and that's that's as it should be. But these, we went back and shot the movie in Baltimore where I'm from and it made a huge difference because um, we were able to find a high school location that you haven't seen in 50 movies, kids who really came to it with their full heart and don't have agents kind of telling them not to, you know, not to hang out for 12 hours over coffee with me talking about their character or whatever, <laughs> you know? Um, so, yeah, we also had Pat Moran casted, who's won uh, several Emmys for casting on The Wire, among other things. But she was John Waters' producer when he started out and she produced Pink Flamingos and Female Trouble and she's, you know, royalty in the Baltimore film community and also an incredible casting director because she has the ability to find people and see something in them. So I was lucky to, to have that partnership. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. The only person I recognized at all was the one that played uh, Miss Persephone. I think she was in bring it on. I, 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 I was like, I know I've seen her somewhere. So I finally looked it up. I was like, that, that's the only one that looked familiar. And I like, I kind of like when there's a movie where I don't recognize anybody like that. Cause you know, like you said, it adds something when you know you, cause then you can really full in, good into their character that they're supposed, supposed to be not rather than what they've been in something else. Sure. Yeah. I, I feel the same way. I, I, um, yes. Claire Kramer who plays Miss Persephone is in, uh, my vampire movie, the thirst and uh, oh, she's right, been in a right, lot right. of genre stuff and she does a lot of conventions, a lot of uh, where she'll, you know, um, uh, host a panel with, with, with Stan Lee or whatever. She's very involved in that world. But, you know, she's, she's deep in, in, in the genre world. She had Geek Nation was her website oh, for a long, yeah, long time. Yeah, yeah. Um, and Muse Watson is actually in this movie who played um, kind of the, the – uh, Gordon's fisherman looking dude in I Know What You Did Last Summer and is in a lot of those kind of movies. And he plays mm. Mouse's father, the Gus. Uh, oh, right, the, yeah. Uh, you know, he looked familiar, but I didn't look him up because I just assumed he had that look that looked familiar. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. He flew to Baltimore. He and Claire flew to Baltimore. He has a favor to the producer who they're neighbors, I think, and Claire because, you know, we love working together and she had done The Dead with the Thirst. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. All right. So, Jeremy, I'm trying to ask this question. I don't want to go into spoiler. Yeah, country, this, this, this is tricky to talk this, about. These are tricky movie. to talk about because we don't want to talk about spoilers uh, before our listeners get to get to see the movie. But as with any horror movie, there are twists and turns. Let's just put it that way. Right. So what are some of the challenges in directing in filming a movie that has, you know, important plot twists and things like that where you you really have to 
set your pacing and, and figure out when to reveal things and when not. I just, just curious about the process of filming a, a movie in which uh, you, you have to keep some surprises uh, for the viewer. It is very difficult because you, um, you can't, write sloppy you have to know you're shooting the script that you hope will be the final product because you don't really get to shift scenes around very much which a lot of movies do to to fix pacing problems or reveal something about a character earlier than and realize that you need that information but i think in this case i uh my editor i did not edit the movie the editor had been my assistant editor and he had started editing for me uh, a couple movies ago and being able to trust him that he was thinking about that stuff so i could just sit next to him and watch the film more like a viewer and that he was thinking about the things that i couldn't possibly anymore what what's revealed when helped a lot i also decided after the first cut, which was not watchable, it was two and a half hours long, I think, that it didn't really matter whether you figured out the twist or whatever early on. It did, it, the, the key is to make a movie that even if that happens, that you're still as compelled to watch the rest of it, which I don't think with movies with like big reveals is always the case. I think I would have been pissed if I had figured out the... Um, uh, oh my gosh what's the name of that movie oh, Six Sense Six Sense yes. <laughs> if I knew if I'd figured it out 15 minutes in I might have been like oh my god I'm gonna sit through this it's so slow so <laughs> yeah. knowing that you have an audience's attention either way I think takes some of the heat off of uh, uh, them unwrapping it because people who watch horror movies are always trying to guess what's going on <laughs> That's it's, right. it's what we do yeah, yeah. Tim and I joke too because our wives are like ones that like figure it out like in two minutes. It seems like every time. Oh, it drives so, me crazy. Yeah, and I'm like, and me, I get like some more. You know, I, I'm like kind of the one, and Tim's the same way. We try and get invested in the whole thing, so it's almost like sure. we're so close to it that we could miss something. But I actually, what I thought you did was, or you know, just the, the whole process in this movie was so great is that, you know, as it was going on, you know, you know, a sharp viewer can see where this is leading but i still but like you said i think you really just kept just enough dangling the carrot and bringing so much information that it's like even when you kind of knew where it was going you just wanted to see it. you were so invested in it and you wanted to see it and i thought that was such a strong point to this movie thank you the goal is to make a movie that people want to watch more than once and so if if i can pull that off even as sort of nasty as this film is <laughs> then, then i feel like that i will have succeeded in in giving my audience the movie i wanted to make well i think especially a movie like this this is one that you know would almost guarantee a second watch because then you kind of want to go in and see now let's see oh did i catch this was there something else there was there something so i already know that i i'm i plan to watch it again so it's <laughs> so awesome. if, if that makes you feel a little better for, it like, does by a lot i love that yeah of course <laughs> So, and actually, here's the next question we have. You kind of you kind of touched on this a little bit, but uh, it'll be good uh, to elaborate a little more. So, Tim and I often mention a lot of uh, on our show a lot that a primary location or a set piece can become a character of its own. So, in finding the setting for the school in the Dead Ones, obviously, was extremely important to the to this movie. So, what can you tell us about that process? It was hard because even in 2009, you would show up at a school. You know, it was summertime. That's why we shot in the summer. And we'll say, we're making a kind of a school shooter ghost story here at your <laughs> high school. Uh, cool. <laughs> and pretty much every school was like, no. no <laughs> you can't do that. And I understand, again, why, but it made it very difficult because we had, we had, I was committed to having it feel like an East Coast school and not a, not a California, Los Angeles stucco building school and that made it hard we found a church that had uh purchased a school building from the 30s that took over the um auditorium which is why we shot in a different auditorium and i think the first floor but there were two or three other floors that like you know they opened the windows the day the school closed 25 years ago and all the birds came in and it was just it was crazy <laughs> desks and chairs and 
books and everything everywhere. So it made it made it easy in a way to make a movie that that um, you know again without revealing too much operates um, you know both in the past and the present. And there's a hellscape version and a and a and a uh, past version that that has to look pristine but be the same location. Yeah, I got actually a, there was a I don't know if you're a video game fan, but I kind of really got a Silent Hill vibe with that. I don't know Silent Hill, but oh, okay. that's, that's cool. <laughs> yeah, Tim is a big gamer. He'll know, but look it up, and you'll you'll see exactly what I meant. Because it's, it's a compliment. Yes, <laughs> it's, a, it's a huge compliment because that's one of the coolest parts about that game is the, the eeriness and the, and yeah, and the the a lot of the for lack of a better word, I guess it's probably the perfect word. It was very haunting the hallways through there, you know, and it's like, and it was really an unsettling feeling going through those. The, a lot of those scenes, which is, I'm sure, your intention. <laughs> Absolutely, that is the intention. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so Jeremy, uh, this is kind of your chance to pitch this movie. Um, I, I've got my own ideas about this question, and and the question was, how do you feel the Dead One stands out, and and what kind of pitch would you give people that that you think might be interested? I mean, for me personally, like I touched on earlier, I think it covers some themes I'd never seen done quite this way in a horror movie uh, yeah. especially the school shooting stuff which is terrifying in real life it's terrifying in this movie as well um, so it's really neat to see uh, something like that portrayed and I think there were some visuals in here that were really really interesting so uh, what's your uh, what's your pitch for uh, for the folks that are interested in watching this film oh man that's hard I'm never I'm sure everybody says this at this point part, part <laughs> uh, this is like one of my always has been one of my weak spots so if I if I babble, you'll uh, you'll. That's why off. I helped you out a little bit. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I I have to say I think that it's fucking terrifying. School shootings are terrifying. The subject matter is terrifying. But taking it on in a um, a hellscape and in a more um, sideways psychedelic approach, more nightmarish, really, and and building a world rather than just telling the story like a drama might of a school shooting. But but setting a film in a in a in a hellacious world where you're trying to piece together the past, and you're constantly aware that something dreadful is going to happen, is is you know, if you're a horror fan, that's incredibly satisfying because you're visiting a the most terrifying haunted house possible, and it's um a movie that doesn't talk down, I think, to to its intended audience. I think a lot of horror does. I think a lot of horror, especially with teenagers, has stupid characters doing stupid things and they're not really relatable. And it, it's kind of clear that the filmmakers look down on their audience. And I think that this movie respects its subject matter, still delivers on the scares and gore and, you know, it's deeply upsetting. And yet it doesn't ever compromise the performances and the, the storytelling. I yeah, agree. No, yeah, yeah, you did. I mean, it was a really, um, I, I think that's a good pitch because if I, if I didn't know about it and I heard you discussing that, I'd be like, all right, I got to see this. <laughs> so I think you I did a great know, job. But it's hard to know what people, you know, are, are, are craving. And you sort of always hope that what you made lands. You can't, you can't entirely, I know what I like to watch and I know what, what horror movies thrill me and when something comes out, what's going to make me stop and pay attention. And so I can only really judge on that because I've made you know plenty of things in the past that I was like, I, I think this is cool. And had people be like, I hate your movie. So I get it. We all have that. Yeah, well, I think to me, see, I, I, I joke about this sometimes on the podcast that I can't get scared anymore. So it's like, because I've seen so much and from an early age, but, but what I like is I think I like movies that now have this, like I said before, unsettling uh, nature to it. And this had it because the whole time, you know, you just feel uneasy. And at points, you're not sure what you're you feel uneasy about, but you know, it's building up to something. So you get this tension. So it, it gives you this like rush. And that's what I got from this. Because it was like, I, I you know, it's like, even once I, I got to the point, like I said earlier, when I knew where it was going, I was like, I, like, I was like, excited, because I wanted to see you get there, you know, and find the, every, you know, get it all out there. So that's awesome. I'm thrilled to hear that. 
So yeah, we'll, we'll definitely, of course, uh, we'll, we'll, when we hear this, uh, hopefully all our listeners will kind of get, because we, we, we like to hope we, we tantalize people into to watching what we like too. So. Absolutely. Yeah, of course. <laughs> so I guess here, here's kind of the fun uh, ending to the interview here. So uh, why don't you, uh, where can people follow you on like the socials and stuff to find out more about this movie and also what do you got planned next? Sure. So I have uh, my own website, jeremycaston.com, and that has my regular editing work and the stuff that I'm doing just in life. And then mm. from the menu is all my horror stuff. And I think is, you know, everything going back to 1996 with the Attic Expeditions and, and, and you know, covering the gamut from spook shows to the dead ones and news for the dead ones. I'm uh, on Twitter as Jeremy scare me and oh, on nice. <laughs> Facebook as Jeremy scare me. And, but really on Facebook following the dead ones makes so much more of an impact for the, you know, distributor and, and the companies that are actually going to get the movie out there that, that, you know, signing up there is, is super awesome. And, and that's really at the moment, the hub, because we just landed our, our date. And so it's, it's, um, it's sort of happening fast now. It's great. Yeah. So it's, I think it's coming out right. September. Um, yeah. on it, is that on, is that coming right on to um, uh, physical media or it's VOD and both. Yep. VOD oh, okay. and, and Blu-ray you can pre-order on Amazon. Oh, it's the first movie I've ever had at Best Buy and Walmart. Oh, My friend nice. sent me a link where a library ordered it today. I don't know what's going <laughs> oh, cool. on, but I can't, you know, maybe there's just not enough new stuff coming out, but great. I'm going to see my school shooting horror movie at Walmart. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, we, they joke, uh, we, we have a funny name cause I have an extensive Blu-ray collection that uh, Tim had lovingly nicknamed as he saw it in the background once as the monolith because ah. it's just a massive wall of blue it's a wall so i can say safely that it, and, and confidently that this will become a, a member of the monolith for sure i will definitely purchase that and we will probably actually discuss it again as we do a monthly uh show we call it the disc memberment where we go through all the upcoming uh blu-rays in horror for the month so when wow. we do record the september i'm sure that will be listed in there and we'll make sure it is and we'll definitely talk about it then so that's fabulous we have uh, some some goodies on that blu-ray including two featurettes that are that are some really cool behind the scenes stuff one on the makeup effects and the artist mm -hmm. who did them told by the makeup effects intern who we interviewed on the set <laughs> And oh, she's nice. so enthusiastic and excited to be there and just a great way to sort of learn about what happened and a piece on the location, which you asked me about where oh, the cool, designer cool, takes nice. you through. We did two separate commentary tracks, one with the cast and one with the, the editor who edited the movie for 11 years and did <laughs> upwards of 700 digital effect shots by the end. And the, myself and the, the uh, executive producer sort of going through this 11 years of, of seeing this movie come together. Oh, cool. Well, That's that, great. Yeah, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a sucker for special features, so I'm all in already. But now That's I'm awesome. really all in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, Jeremy, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, it was a fantastic interview, and uh, I can't wait for our listeners to get a chance to see the movie for themselves. I'm so happy to have been asked on, and I'm really glad you guys enjoyed the movie. And I, uh, I appreciate you helping me get the word out. Oh, yes. Anytime. Any future yes. projects, just uh, just give us a shout. 